We're on to the hardest writing in the novel. It's more critical than the creative flow we have had with all our scenes. It's more critical than the creative fun we've had as well. This week's work is essential to create a smooth flow of the novel for our readers. And what we will write this week cannot be boring. What is this week's focus? We're building the bridges. Come along and find out. Welcome to The Right Focus. We cover productivity, process, craft, and tools. Our podcast episodes last as long as it takes to fix a quick dinner, drive a short commute, or take a brisk walk. All through the summer months, we focus on the craft of writing novels and novellas and epics, from beginning ideas to prepping for publication, week by week by week. In this week, we finalize our manuscript. For the past weeks, we've sketched the basic scenes for characters and plot. Then we shaped those into a rough form, and we built the bulk of scenes that form the skeleton of the novel. It's not there yet, though, not as a complete manuscript. After this week, we hit analysis and revision. And revision is not rewriting the story. It's fixing and adding and removing. Once we have proofreading and corrections completed, then we publish. We still have a little bit of plot shaping to finalize, but we're going to draft in a strong start to our novel. First, let's set out the developed scenes. Now we can see what we don't have and what we do have. Dwight V. Swain, in Techniques of the Best-Selling Writer, explains that books are made up of scenes and sequels. Every scene has five points. Those five points are derived from the seven-point plot used by Algis Boudris at the Clarion Writing Workshop. First, we have a character. That character is in a setting, number two. And that character in a setting must have a problem, three. Fourth, the character tries to solve the problem. And fifth, the character fails to solve the problem and in failing makes the problem worse. Sequels are the bridges between the scenes where the character tries to solve the problem. Sequels are hardest to write. I'm serious. They are totally hard. Sequels create the flow between the scenes. Without them, the readers jerked through the book, scene to scene. And we have to keep those sequels interesting. In the scene, the primary viewpoint character is active. In the sequel, the character considers what has occurred, considers the current position in the continuing situation, and considers potential past to move ahead toward the goal. A lot of considering. Then the sequel provides the launch into the next scene. A chapter can be a long scene followed by a sequel or multiple scenes followed by their sequels. Then we launch toward the next scene. The character in the seven point plot, the one who deals with the problem, solves the problem but fails to solve the problem, that is our viewpoint character. And it can be our protagonist, the antagonist, or another primary or secondary character. Only three basic viewpoints exist for storytelling. We can find various names for these, depending on the sources that we use, including deep point of view. The classic terms are these. Objective viewpoint is no character's thoughts or feelings presented, only outward behaviors, actions, and reactions. Sometimes this is described as whatever a fly on the wall would see. Objective viewpoint prevents empathy with characters. Most often used is the omniscient viewpoint. This is the thoughts and feelings of more than one character presented throughout the novel. You can have the deep point of view with two characters, the antagonist and the protagonist, two protagonists, three protagonists, the protagonist, the antagonist, and several secondary characters. It doesn't matter how many you have as long as you give their thoughts and feelings. When we have the viewpoint of only one character, then you have limited. The thoughts and feelings of that one character are presented throughout the novel. Nobody else's thoughts and feelings are presented. Since we're on viewpoint, I'll give you the major no-no as well. Don't head hop in a scene. What is head hopping? It's jumping from the thoughts and feelings of one character into another character's head all in the same scene, sometimes on the same page, sometimes even in the same paragraph. We don't head hop. We have seen master writers do this, but newbies should not, and many, many writers should not. When I see master writers do it, I cringe. I know why they did it, but it still irritates me. 
Most readers also do not like to read a scene which is then retold from another character's viewpoint. Yes, we want to get across what each character is thinking. Why not do that in separate scenes? The omniscient viewpoint in a novel allows us to show character growth, which the objective viewpoint does not, and which, in the limited viewpoint, sounds arrogant. I thought this, I decided this, versus he thought this, he decided this, or she thought this, or she decided this. It's not arrogant. So, for those who have more than one viewpoint character, the first thing to determine when launching into the draft is which character will tell each scene. The only thing to remember is that the number of scenes and sequels for primary characters must outnumber those for secondary characters. Otherwise, secondary characters become primary. Most importantly, with the draft done, we need to rework the opening, not just to bring it into line with all the scenes that developed later, but because we need to make a strong opening. Here are three options and more. Opening option number one, walk the primary viewpoint character into the scene, describe the situation, then the setting. Give that character's attitude about both, then roll into the action. An alternative is to walk into the scene with a secondary character, whose viewpoint will recur consistently throughout the book, although it will not dominate. Beginning with a secondary character allows us to present special characteristics of the protagonist without the protagonist appearing arrogant. Or, we can begin with the antagonist, exhibiting all the evil we have invested into that character. That opening is classic for a book about a murderer or a serial killer. Even if the antagonist does not provide viewpoint scenes and sequels in the book, we can open with this. We need to remain an objective viewpoint if we're not presenting the scene from a non-viewpoint character. Option two is to begin with a dominant symbol or image for the entire book. Present the image objectively as anyone would see it. Then walk in the protagonist or another character and present that character's opinion of the symbol or image. This technique is often used for noir mysteries or thrillers or fantasies or science fiction. Option three is to begin with a highly active event, an objective viewpoint, the end of which brings the primary viewpoint character into the story. Thrillers, action adventure, what am I saying? All genres can begin this way. No matter which option we choose for an opening, we need to insert a question in the reader's mind. Who is the person? How can he or she be stopped? Or how can she or he stop this horrible event? Why is she or he doing this? Why does the event keep getting worse? Who is helping the person? This is especially effective when an antagonist has a minion. The minion is stopped. Then an action occurs that is clearly caused by someone else. When this happens, the reader knows the problem is not limited to one enemy, whether this is an action adventure with an explosion or a literary novel where a person's venom is blocked only to have an unknown person cause more conflict among seemingly similar people in the neighborhood or workplace. This method starts many novels. I have seen several writing rules for opening, including don't start with the weather. True. Start with the viewpoint character experiencing the weather. Give that character's opinion of the weather. Reader engagement occurs emotionally. Readers need to emphasize with the characters, be intrigued or be horrified. Three things attract a reader to a book. The cover, which is the back copy or sales copy, and the opening sentence. The opening sentence is our focus now. We may not have gotten the sentence exactly right when we first wrote the beginning of our novel. We had to start with something. But now that we're looking at it, now that we know the entire book, we can look for the best opening sentence, just as we look for the best tagline to center the book. Here are some sample opening sentences. Look at how many use opposition or unusual circumstances. Also look at how simple many of these sentences appear. Barbara Hambly in the Silicon Maj. The worst thing about knowing that Gary Fairchild had been dead for a month was seeing him every day at work. In this line, death is juxtaposed with life and we have an impossibility. How can someone who is dead be at work every day? Mary Stewart 
My Brother Michael starts with, Nothing ever happens to me. I wrote the words slowly, looked at them for a moment with a little sigh, then put my ballpoint pen down on the little cafe table and rummaged in my handbag for a cigarette. That opening creates an emotional connection with readers. The whole novel creates the adventure for us and the viewpoint character. Also Mary Stewart in The Gabriel Hounds. I met him in the street called Straight. That's simple, obviously foreign. We question who? Who did she meet? Where do we have a street called Straight? Amy Tan, The Joy Luck Club, begins. My father asked me to be the fourth corner at the Joy Luck Club. We have several questions here. What is the Joy Luck Club? What is the fourth corner? Why does the father ask? The classic opening line of Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca. Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. What is Manderley? Why return in a dream? For Stephen King's The Gunslinger, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed. Who are these people? Another short line comes to us from J.M. Barry's Peter and Wendy. All children except one grow up. Who is the exception? Why does that child not grow up? William Goldman in The Princess Bride. This is my favorite book in all the world, though I have never read it. We have another juxtaposition. How can a book be the favorite but never be read? Dodie Smith, I Capture the Castle, which is simple. I write this sitting in the kitchen sink. Why are we sitting in the kitchen sink? The title is also key to our intrigue. How can someone capture a castle? Ha Jin's Waiting. Every summer, Lin Kong returned to Goose Village to divorce his wife, Shu Yu. How can he divorce the same person every summer? Do they remarry? Do they never divorce? What's going on here? Victoria Holtz, Pride of Pendork. I often marveled after I went to Pendork that one's existence could change so swiftly, so devastatingly. We have three important words here, marveled, swiftly, and devastatingly. And now we wonder, what's important about Pendork? What will change people so much? Alice Walker's The Color Purple is short and strong. You better not never tell nobody but God. This is a classic line of all abuse scenarios. With the title, we get the curiosity of many readers. Graham Greene, The End of the Affair. A story has no beginning or end. Arbitrarily, one chooses that moment of experience from which to look back or from which to look ahead. We have more classic opposition here. Beginning and end. Looking back, looking ahead. The green quotation, of course, is guidance for all writers. Our decisions are always arbitrary. We have writing rules for this week. Whatever method or option or opening, we arbitrarily choose whether we write the first scene to tell our story chronologically, whether we jump to a major scene and construct the puzzle pieces of the great novel Jigsaw. We have five writing rules. One, begin. Two, write best copy. Format correctly from the start. Keep everything organized. Three, have a clean draft. Tell the story that we want to read. Four, avoid gaps in the scenes and the sequels. Don't put in gobbledygook. And five, remember, writer's block doesn't exist. Many more professional writers than myself adhere to this philosophy. You may have encountered on Pinterest or writing blogs such posts as 10 types of writer's block and how to overcome them. Here's the truth. Whether someone lists 10 types or 20 types, or seven, they all fall into three broad categories. Writer's refusal, writer's procrastination, and inertia. Refusal occurs when writers feel burnt out. They need to schedule a break or an escape. The creative brain needs to be recharged, which can only happen if we take a day off or two. Procrastination is born of fear, fear of failure, or fear of rejection. We all want to be liked. We want our writing, the pourings of our heart, to be liked. We don't want to be ridiculed, so we put off our writing dreams because we don't want people to mock us or worse, not buy our writing. Get over those fears and just do it. Inertia is either depression or stagnation. I'm not talking about clinical depression. That's different. To fight depression, change your diet to avoid sugars and starches. Increase water intake and start exercise. Just walking is great. We give in to stagnation when we claim that we have to wait on the muse. 
We don't wait on inspiration. Inspiration waits on us. Never refuse a challenge and seek out change to avoid slimy stagnation. How to overcome writer's block? Write a sentence. Then the next sentence. Then the sentence that comes after that one. Then the next and the next and so on. We may not like these sentences. We may want to rewrite them. Don't. Not until the whole manuscript is finished. Let creativity flow. Never critique or correct writing in the same session with creativity. That crosses the wires between the two sides of the brain. Two people are in constant arguments with each other. The critical editor and the creative muse. When we're writing, let the creative muse flow. For every writing session, after you glance over your map scenes and sequels, start every writing session with a jot list of seven items to accomplish. As we draft, we let the ideas pour out, whether handwriting or typing. Rewind from the rapid flow to add in and fix things. Continue with the rapid flow writing. When we wind down, rewind to add and fix. Then sink into the rapid flow draft again. Dean Wesley Smith calls this cycling, a method he explains in Writing into the Dark, an excellent reference for a writing bookshelf. Rapid writing and cycling back through is the best method for starting any session's writing. Save careful construction for the next stage, revision, after the manuscript is finished. In this week's launch, we want to get sentences onto the page and turn those sentences into sequels that will bridge all our scenes. Remember to follow the five writing rules. Begin, write to best copy, clean draft, avoid the gaps, don't put in gobbledygook, and remember writer's block doesn't exist. Write the next sentence and the next and the next. End each session with a jot list for the next session. I usually have items left over from my start list. Finally, at the end of this week, we should have a completed manuscript. This is the story we want people to read. Revision begins with an analysis of our complete draft. What's good? What's bad? What's ugly? Does everything work together? Is our story right? That's our focus next week. Join us for pacing our novel. Inspiration this week comes from Sinclair Lewis. Writers kid themselves about themselves and other people. Take the talk about writing methods. Writing is just work. There's no secret. If you dictate or use a pen or type, or type with your toes. It is just work. We've had definite work this week. By the end, our brain should be fried. Southern fried chicken is the best, especially with a dash of cayenne in the flour-based batter. Did you add that dash of cayenne in every sequel? Great. Writers have to know the recipes. Thanks for listening to The Right Focus, a podcast for writers at all of us, hosted by M.A. Lee, with the assistance of Remy Black and Edie Rooms from Writers, Inc. Books. All through the summer months, our focus is the craft of writing. We are discovering your novel, from beginning idea to prepping for publication. We'll work through the process stages of foundations to story, envisioning the story, analyzing story before, during, and after the draft, harvesting the story through revisions and enhancements, and prepping the story for publication. Many of these preps and guides are useful setups for the National Novel Writing Month in November. That's writing only, you know, no idea work. We can also use this information to solve issues with stories that we've abandoned. All those stories are crying in the wilderness. Time to rescue them with the right focus. Show notes for this and other episodes can be found at therightfocus.blogspot.com. Write to us at winkbooks at aol.com. Remember, whatever occurs, write on.